This is a moment where the country is just overwhelmed by lies, right? Where it's hard for people to know the difference between what's real and not at that boundary line where the truth and the lie are converging. And Josh Hawley goes out there and he talks about manhood, as you, as you mentioned. Here's what I say to my kids, my son, I, and, I, and I think this applies equally, you know, to men and women, you know, but to my son, what I, what I tell him is, you got to know when to, when to stand up. And you got to know when to put your toes on the line. You also got to know when to back up off that line. You, you got to know when you're wrong, how to say you're sorry. You, you have to know when it's time to advance off that line, right? And, and to step forward, right? Even when you're afraid. And character, uh, decency gentleness. I mean, meanness is not toughness. Cynicism. All of these things that define Josh Hawley and this strange dogma of control, as you said, in the bedroom, in the confessional, from cradle to grave, Josh Hawley wants to watch over you. What is what is a man, right? There's so many people that talk about the crisis of the American male, suicide epidemic, epidemic of loneliness, despair, all of these things. A lot of people talk about this. My, my friend Maria Shriver talks about this a lot and writes eloquently about it. And, and Josh Hawley has, has his version of manhood and you read that book, and it's shocking, but that's not manhood in, in any way, shape, or form in the sense of, and we're about the same age, close enough, but, but, but completely alien to the men that were around in my life as a boy, as a young man, it's, they would not recognize the, the manhood archetype of, of someone like Josh Hawley. They would, they, they would, in other words, they would find him repellent. Right? They, they, would, they would find him disgraceful. They, they would find him cowardly and cowering uh, from his craving, lust for power at any cost. One of the, one of the most privileged people in the country by virtue of his education, by his opportunities. He, he is the anti-manhood guy against the archetype of the American male, at least the archetype that I grew up admiring. And I wanted to ask you, when you think about manhood, who do you think about? Well, you know, I, I, I think about those Marines. I'll give you I'll give you another example of a guy. So for me, it's it's doing the right thing when nobody's looking. It's taking care of folks. It's not doing things for the show. Like obviously jo Josh Holly and that company, they're all about the show. And uh, and I, I, I will say there is there is actually a moment when it all clicked for me, like multiple things clicked at once. And, it, and it's because um, uh, a guy who had no reason to do something for me just took an extra minute out of his day and did. And so uh so I'm going to tell you what happened here. I was in ninth grade and uh, and like my family was broke in ninth grade. And I, I mean, like my dad would drop me off at school in this old rusted out Ford conversion van. And I would have him drop me off down the hill because it just like squeaked so loud when the brakes were hit and he didn't have the money to fix it. And uh, and I really just like wanted to find myself in ninth grade. And, uh, and I was I was uh, I was struggling to do that. And uh, and then one day. I got assigned to a project um, with a with this girl named Jennifer, who was who was cool. Like she lived on the other side of town in one of those neighborhoods where they got like you know signs outside of it, which you know you made it if you live in uh, in a small town with a with a neighborhood with a sign on it. And uh, and so um, we got assigned to this project. We worked on it in school. We were having a good time. And uh, and then she she invited me over to her house uh, one day to finish it after school. 
And so, uh, and so her mom came, picked us up, took us to her house and uh, so we're over there. And I mean, I'm living large, right? Like they got name brand Oreos, you know, none of the boxes are yellow. We're having all the good snacks and, uh, and, and I'm loving it. We're getting along well and, uh, and we're becoming friends. And, um, and so then, you know, the, we wrap up the project, hang out for a little bit. We're hanging with her mom and, uh, and then her dad comes in. Uh, he got home from work and a uh, huge guy, like this big burly dude. He actually worked in law enforcement and, uh, and was, was a pretty intimidating guy. And, uh, you know, he says a couple of hellos, ask how we're doing, ask how the project did. It all went well. And uh, so we chat for a little bit and then, then he's like, OK, all right, son, it's uh, it's time to take you home. And uh, I didn't want them to take me by my house because it was in a rough neighborhood and, uh, and it didn't look that hot. And, and I was embarrassed. And so uh, I had a plan for this, though. I was like, oh, don't worry about it. So, uh, don't worry about it, sir. You know, my dad's not too far from here. I'm just going to call him up. He said he'd pick me up down the street. I was like, that was my plan, right? He's, they're not gonna even going to see my van because I'll just walk down to the corner. And, uh, and her dad's like, oh, no, son. If you come over to our house, you're our guest and we take you home. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's okay, it's okay sir. Honestly, I already, I already arranged it all. He's like, son, we're giving you a ride home. And I'm like, oh, God. All right. All right. Um, how am I going to do this? And uh, so we go get into this. I'd never been in a fancy car before, I swear to God. And uh, and they've got this big, beautiful black Cadillac. It's like right out of a Johnny Cash song, right? And uh, and uh, and so I'm like, okay, I get into the car. I'm like, dang, this thing's nice. And uh, we start driving. And I'm like, how can I make it so that they don't see the things I don't want them to see? And so I think about it. And I'm like, well, if you go the normal way, we're going to go by the gas station that everybody calls ghetto gas. Like the house on the corner is kind of burned out. But if I go around and come up the hill and like take just long enough, maybe the sun will be all the way down. And so I start giving. And, and so he's like, you know, where are you going? Where are we going? And I was like, oh, I'll give you directions, sir. So I start giving him directions. And uh, and after about five minutes, he's he's catching on. He's like, these are some pretty funky directions for where I think we're going. I'm like, oh, no, sir, just go out to this road and then turn right. And he kind of looks back and he's like, uh, do you know where you're going? And uh, and I'm like, oh, yes, sir. I've lived there my whole life. And, and he's like, well, I've lived in this town, not my whole life, but a lot longer than yours. And uh, and he's like, what uh, what are the streets? And I was like, oh, it's uh, Dunklin Street in Ewing. And I named this really tiny short street that's got like five houses on it uh, because I'm just sure he won't know it. And he's like, hmm okay uh he's like actually i think i know where that is and i was like oh, okay well whatever and i and i still maneuver him around and um and so i think i've done it the sun is setting we're coming up the hill to my house and um and he and uh and of course i hadn't thought about that end of the street because nobody ever comes from that way and um you know we go by a house that uh you know half the windows are out up and it's falling apart and i'm just like oh i try to distract them a little bit we close up on my house. I'm like, oh, mine's the one uh, at the top of the hill. And as we pull up, uh, I remember or obviously realized that uh, my parents, they repainted our house um, as best they could. We all did it as a family together. You know, my mom's out there with the heat gun. Us kids are helping paint. And uh, they didn't have enough money to paint the whole house. And so they had left that side um, unpainted because it was the side nobody comes up from anyway. And, uh, and I, you know, I realized my mistake. I see just like the, the paint, like scaling off that side of the house and I'm so embarrassed. And, uh, you know, he keeps looking at me in the rear view mirror, wondering what's going on. And we get there and I'm like, thanks for the ride. Uh, and, uh, you know, my friend Jennifer, she doesn't pay attention to anything. Obviously she's like, Oh, it was great to have you. I'll see you tomorrow at school. Uh, but I'm just so dejected. And, um, and I get out of the car and I close the door and I mumble something and I start to walk away and, you know, I'm going down our sidewalk, just, just praying like, dear God, please let them just leave. Please just let them leave. And uh, I can like feel this guy looking at me. And then the worst thing happens. Like I hear, I hear a car door open and then clunk behind me. And I'm like, Oh God, he's going to chew me out because he knows that I just went like 20 minutes out of the way to avoid everything because he knows where we are now. And he's going to go straight back. And, uh, and, and I hear son and it's like big, deep voice. And I'm like, so I just turn around and I'm like, I'm just going to take it like a man. And I turn around and I look at him. He's just looking at me, looming over that big black Cadillac. And, uh, and he looks, he looks at me, he looks up at the house and he looks back at me and he says, son, 
I just want you to know how proud I am that you came over and worked on this project with Den Jennifer. I'm so proud you're her friend. We'd be proud to come over to your house anytime. You're a great kid and you're going to make it. And he just got back in his car and uh, and drove off. You know, he could have been annoyed with me. He could have said something mean. He could have ignored me. But instead, he took a moment to let me know that I mattered. Again, when nobody's looking, he's never going to get any credit for this, right? It, it means nothing. It's something he didn't have to do. But, you know, for a kid on the other side of town, he took that moment to let me know I could be proud of who I was. I could oh, be wow. proud of who, of where I come from, right? I can be proud of my family because we're good people. And it was just, it was an incredible moment for me. And uh, probably the only real sad part out of that for me is, um, you know, I studied hard in school after after uh, after that. I got all A's. I was all state athlete. I got into Yale University. I got to go on a Pell Grant, which, you know, if you don't have enough money, they they help you out. And, uh, and and I wanted to say thank you. And I went back to try to find him and, and he'd actually passed away. And so, um, you know, um, the one thing, the other thing I learned from that is you got to say thanks to the people who, who mean something to you, even if they don't know. But like, that's what it means uh, to be a man to me. Wow. What a story. Um, how a little choked up, honestly. Um... I hope I didn't ramble for too long. <laughs> no, I, um, but we've got very, heroes very, like that very, all around very our powerful. state, all around our country. And that's not who people are hearing from, right? They're hearing from the media bully attention hogs like Josh Holly. That's not who we are. That's not who Missourians are. And I'm telling you, Missourians are fed up with it. It's why he's the least popular person up for reelection. It's why we're going to win this campaign. He doesn't understand us. He doesn't know how we grow up. He doesn't understand the things we do for each other. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so you never miss a video. Also, for more content just like this, please consider joining our Warning Premium community. You can find out more in the description below.